Okay. So for those of you who don't know me, um, my name is SVN Vishwanathan. I'm the lead organizer of the, <laughs> of the summer school, along with Sergey Kirshner, who is uh, uh, <laughs> coming in now. Oh. <laughs> there you go. Thanks for stalling. <laughs> Can you hear me? All right. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Asvel Vishwanathan, who goes by Vishi. Vishi is an associate professor in the Department of Statistics and Department of Computer Science here at Purdue University. Before he joined Purdue University, he was a principal researcher at NICTA in Australia. And he, were, he also had an adjunct appointment at National uh, Australian University in Canberra in the Department of Computer Engineering. Prior to joining NICTA in 2002, he was a graduate student <laughs> at Indian Institute of Science, where he also received his uh, master's degree in 2000. So, uh, Vicious uh, areas of expertise actually is very broad. So optimization is only part of it. It's also very well known uh, in the kernel community and also in the community uh, of structure prediction. Let me add a couple more words. So, um, how many of you have received travel, travel award to attend um, this event? Would you mind stepping up? Stand up. So, about half of the participants received this award, and I have to say that these awards are almost independently due to vision. Uh, in addition to this. <laughs> I'll go even further and say that if it weren't for him, there wouldn't be the summer school at all. So it's, it's almost his brainchild, we just kind of tagged along and helped him along the way. But realistically, without his relentless effort, you probably wouldn't be here today. So please join me now. And just <laughs> okay, since I was a couple of minutes late, I don't want to take any more of his time. There you go. Thank you. Thank you very much for such kind introductions and embarrassing me early in the morning. <laughs> for, but it's really good. Thank you very much. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is one of the areas that I'm very interested in, which is how can you design optimization algorithms which are specifically tuned for machine learning? So as most of you know, um, when we do machine learning, more or less what we do is we end up building models. And in Dale Schurman's course, you learned a lot about how to build models, how can you combine various regularizers and loss functions together. But then once you have done that, more or less what happens is that you end up with an optimization problem. And then the next step is to actually, that's where I call the rubber hits the road, which is you have to go and solve this optimization problem. Okay? So if you try to do this on a small scale, or if you're just trying to prototype one, say, 100 or 200 points, more or less you can go to your favorite language, maybe MATLAB, maybe Python, maybe something else, and call a simple convex optimizer, and more or less it should do the job. But when you want to scale things up, and when you want to go to larger data sets, more interesting problems, then it turns out that this kind of just taking a hammer and hitting the nail doesn't quite work. You need to do something slightly more sophisticated, and sometimes actually you need to do things more, yeah, slightly more dumber. Okay, so what I'm going to show you in these four hours that I have is, for, so, so basically I, I'll, I'll show you how to design some custom, you know, custom built optimizers for solving machine learning problems. Our prototypical running example will be a linear support vector machine. Okay, so, but before we get into all that, the first hour, I want to show you lots of pretty pictures. It's too early in the morning. You know, not many of you want to see equations that early in the morning. And then I'll hit you with lots of equations. Okay? So, um, so, okay. So, you saw in Dale Sherman's lectures, this 
particular principle of regularized risk minimization, which came up very frequently in, in his talks, or either explicitly or implicitly while he was talking. Okay? So in machine learning, what you want to do is you want to build a model. Right? So this is, this is basically your goal, and that's why you're all here at the summer school, because you all want to learn how to build models. Okay? And of course, you want to build models which predict well on data. Right? I mean, that's, that's the whole point of uh, machine learning. How well does a model do? If somebody comes and asks you, OK, how, how, do you, how do you quantify how well does your model do? One way to answer this question in a quantitative manner is to say, well, I have some notion of a loss. Okay? And how well my model does is quantified by how much loss the model incurs. Right? So that's why it's important that you design good loss functions. Okay? And perhaps the biggest challenge that you face when you're working with machine learning problems, as opposed to any other you know, problems where, which involve optimization, is that your model must generalize to unseen data. Right? I mean, that's the, whole, that's, the, that's the whole game which makes machine learning a completely different beast than, say, just doing optimization for doing weather modeling or optimization for designing aircrafts or things like that. Right? Here you really want something which must generalize to unseen data. So it's like you're playing against a player and you don't know what is out there, what is he going to play with, right? So that's the unseen data. A very general principle that people use often in order to avoid overfitting to data is to say, okay, let's go off and penalize complex models. In other words, there's this very, very um, old principle which has been invented and reinvented many times over, but it's very simple to state, which is the Occam's razor. And what Occam's razor tells you is that from among all models which explain your data, choose the simplest one. Right? So that, that is, in some sense, a way to avoid overfitting. In other words, you're not fitting too much to the data. You're not building a very complicated model that explains your data completely, but does not generalize to other data sets. Yeah, so, for instance, again in Dale's lectures, you saw a lot of that. So you could take a, you could take some data, fit a, you know, linear polynomial to it, or you could fit a tenth degree polynomial to it. The tenth degree polynomial, of course, will fit the data perfectly, but then it is not going to generalize to unseen data. Right? So more formally, let's assume that you have some sort of training data, and then you are given some labels. So I'm not, um, I'm not going to consider any of the other very exciting extensions that exist about unsupervised learning, clustering, and so on and so forth. Some of them were dealt with in Marina's talk. But uh, I'm just going to talk about very simple settings. So from my perspective, or from the perspective of my talk, really, um, if you understood how to solve or how to optimize a linear support vector machine and its dual, more or less, you would have covered 80% of what we know. Okay, so that's basically the thought process. So what you want to do is more or less, you want to minimize, you come up with an objective function. So the objective function basically consists of two parts. So the first part is the, what I call the empirical risk. This is nothing but you take a loss function. So your loss measures how well your model, your model W is doing on the data. It averages them over your entire data set. Okay? And then you have a regularizer which says penalize complex models. So the regularizer could, so, and there is, a, there is a parameter lambda which says that how do you trade off between these two factors. Okay? So if you have lambda to be very large, then you believe your regularizer a lot more, and if it is very small, then you believe your data a lot more. Okay? This kind of a setting is rather general and rather abstract. Okay? Not only does it, does it take into account all kinds of frequentist learning frameworks that you would see, but it is also easily extendable, or it is also easily understood in a Bayesian framework. Okay, so if you are uh, just to give you a flavor, not to get into too much details, the regularizer is more or less nothing but a prior in a Bayesian setting, and then the uh, the empirical risk is nothing but the log likelihood, and then you trade off between your prior and your log likelihood, for instance. Okay, so this is a rather general and abstract framework, and this suits us quite well for what we are going to talk about in this talk. And one of the biggest realizations in machine learning, in some sense over the past decade, has been that if you design good empirical risk 
minimizers and if you if you choose the right kind of regularizer to go with it you can build a variety of models right? so instead of before where people would sort of custom build their own models you can now almost make it into an engineering discipline by saying okay what regularizer do i want what regularizer is suitable for this particular problem or this particular purpose what sort of loss function should i use pull the two together put it in plug it into an optimizer and off you're chugging along Okay, so this is kind of what has the sort of a transformation that has happened in the last 10, 15 years or so in machine learning. Okay. And the other big transformation that has happened is that people have more or less realized that if you can make this problem a convex problem, then many, many, many fancy things are possible. Okay. And that's the route that we are going to go today. Okay. So why is convexity all that important. Right? So or, or even before we talk about convexity, what are convex functions? What are, what, are, what are these things that everybody keeps talking about, right? And why do they talk this, this whole convexity notion up? I mean, Dale Shurman's referred to it in his course. You know, other people referred to it in his course. Manfred Warmuth was talking about it in his course. So what are these objects? What are these beasts? And why do we care about them so much? Okay? So in the first hour, what I'm going to do is give you lots of intuition behind convexity and sort of teach you why convexity is such an important concept. Okay? Why, why is it that everybody cares about convexity? And then we will actually do some, some actual stuff with convexity for the rest of the three hours. Okay? So that's the good plan. So what are convex functions? Well, in a one dimension, here is an example of a convex function. Right? Or here is another example of a convex function. So if you go to two dimensions, it's a function which looks like a bowl. And so if you had to describe it to a layman, more or less you'd say, well, a convex function is nothing but something which looks rotund or which looks like a bowl. Okay? This, is a, uh, this is in contrast with a, say, a non-convex function, which would look something like this. So here is an example of a non-convex function. Okay. As opposed to a convex function, which always looks nice and round. Okay. Okay. So before we go on and talk about what these functions are, why are, why are they important, why are they so nice, I want to add a few disclaimers. Okay, so the first disclaimer is that my focus in this talk is to convey intuitions. Okay? And I want to show you sort of pretty pictures. I want to show you sort of intuition on what happens and you know, give you some, some ideas on, on how you can think about convexity. But that also means that I may not be 100% rigorous. Okay? So if you want rigor, Right? You come to my convex analysis class and I, you know, we revel in a semester of rigorousness and you know, worrying about all the corner cases and why a function is closed and what happens at the corners and so on and so forth. Okay? But here, many of those I will sweep under the rug. Okay? So when I'm talking about, when I'm making these broad statements, I'm sure some mathematician will be turning in his grave when I make these statements, but you know, we leave the mathematicians aside and we talk about practical stuff. Okay? And the other thing I want to, I want to talk about is I'm, I'm more or less interested in showing you connections. I want to show you how things are related, how people more or less discover and rediscover many simple algorithms in machine learning. It's just historically they just have not talked to each other or like over a period of time they realized. Okay? And some of these are pretty brand new. Not everybody understands all these connections fully. Okay? So that's sort of the, you know, so there is the, there is the teaching part of the lecture and sort of the fun part of the lecture is to show you that many of these things that you may, some of you may know by different names are actually related. Okay? And then the third disclaimer, which I don't have here, is that this is not intended to be a monologue. 
Okay, so which means that you can stop me at any point of time, ask me questions, tell me, hey, this looks stupid, I can't understand this, or hey, what are you talking about, this is wrong, or hey, you know, can you explain this better? Okay, so let's start now. Questions? Comments? Too early in the morning? Everybody needs a caffeine break? Good. Okay, so please interrupt me, please, please. T ask me questions. You know, I'm, I'm around uh, either during the talk, after the talk, anytime. I'd love to talk to you about this. Okay, okay. so let's dive into the meat of my lectures. What's the, what's the definition of a convex function? Okay, so the definition of a convex function is literally a one liner. Okay? And what is remarkable is that this one liner definition gives you the ability to make global statements about a function. Statements which are significantly important and which hold everywhere. Basically, you can say things, global statements about the function by something which more or less looks like a local statement about this function, right? So, so what is the local statement? What does, what does convexity mean? If suppose I give you a function and you evaluate the function at two different points. Let's call these points x and x prime. Okay, so you evaluate this function and you draw a line which connects these two points. Okay, so if it is a d-dimensional point, you have a d-dimensional line. If you have a two-dimensional function, you have a simple line. Okay? So you have this line which connects these two, two values of the function. And if it turns out that the function uniformly lies below that line. Okay, so if you are more mathematically inclined, you look at this definition. So you're given this function, you're given these two locations, f of x and f of x prime. The, the parametric equation of the line joining them is lambda times f of x and one minus lambda f of x prime. You vary lambda between zero and one, and you recover the entire line. And if it happens that this value is always above the actual value of the function, then you say that the function is convex. Okay, so this is sort of a reasonably local property, except that it has to hold everywhere. Right? So at any two points that I take, x and x prime, if I take any two points and evaluate the function and join the line and look at this, this must hold. Okay, clear? Simple. Now, there are some slight <coughs> extensions of this notion which are important in many cases and which people will, I mean, some of them will be alluded to in my lecture and then there'll be some which will, which uh, for instance, Manfred or Alex or others will talk about in their lectures, okay? So the, the extensions of convexity, there are a couple of them which, uh, which are important. You say that a function is strictly convex if there is no equality, less than equal to, but it becomes an inequality. Right? So in other words, if the, if the convexity condition held strictly, then you call this as a strictly convex function. Okay? So here what I have is actually a strictly convex function. Okay? On the other hand, there is an even more restrictive definition, which is to say a function is what is called sigma strongly convex. So sigma strong convexity simply means that even if you take the function and you subtract out a quadratic out of the function, so you take, you, you, you take your convex function, you subtract out a quadratic, okay? Whatever remains behind is still convex. So it's sort of like the function, uh, one way to think about it, or the way I explain in layman's words, is to say that sort of the function is more quadratic than quadratic. Because even if you take out, even if you subtract a quadratic out of it, the function still remains convex. So these are sort of different notions of convexity and then progressively stronger. So the, of course the weakest notion is convexity, slightly stronger than that is strong convexity and then uh, the, uh, sorry, uh, is strict convexity and then the, the more, the most stringent condition is sigma strong convexity. Okay, yep. No, there exists a sigma so you say that a function is f sigma strongly convex if there exists a sigma such that f minus sigma over two norm squared. Yeah. What extra niceness does this 
uh, what so what strong convex functions usually buy you is that when you're optimizing strongly convex functions, usually you can get faster rates of convergence. And um, we haven't talked about it, and I won't talk so much about Fenchel duality, but if you, if you take the Fenchel dual of a strongly convex function, you're guaranteed that it is, it is smooth, and not just is it smooth, it is actually it has a Lipschitz continuous gradient. Uh, for, for sigma strong convexity? So, like I said, usually if you have sigma strongly convex functions, optimization is a little bit more easier. So, I will, uh, I, we won't talk about this issue today, but in my next lectures when I come back, I will show you how you can improve ra rates of convergence because you know that your function is strongly convex. So, intuitively think of it this way. If you know that your function is, uh, is sigma strongly convex, you know that at least it, is, it has as much curvature as a quadratic, right? So, which means that if you take a step along a certain direction, you know that you will at least make certain progress towards the optimum, okay? So, that's what helps you to get better rates of convergence if you have strongly convex functions, okay? Questions? Good. Okay. And here is an easy exercise. Try this at home. Some of my exercises are pretty easy. You can try them at home. It's more or less an application of the induction principle. And you can show that the definition of convexity can be extended to what many of you may know, which is basically Jensen's inequality. Okay. So I won't do that, but try this at home. This is a, this is a neat exercise. So let me show you a few examples of functions that you have seen and some functions that you would see over the course of lectures here. One of them, or probably the, the, the simplest one, is basically the square norm. Right? So this is just depicted in one dimension, but you can also have a multidimensional version of it. Right? So it's just nothing but one half x square. Here is another example. This is a quadratic function. Actually, this will be a running example when we actually go and do our, some of our warm-up exercises later today. So this is a quadratic function. So you can check that this matrix in the middle is actually a positive semi-definite matrix. So if the matrix in the middle is a positive semi-definite matrix, any function of the form, say, x transpose Ay, where A is a positive semi-definite matrix, is a convex function. Okay, it's basically nothing but an extension of the quadratic, and you just have to verify that the matrix in the middle is positive semi-definite, which means all its eigenvalues are bounded away from zero. Then another one, which is very, very popular, and again, something that will show up many, many times in Manfred's lectures, is the negative entropy. Okay, so this is just the negative entropy for the, for the Bernoulli distribution, okay, just one-dimensional. Okay, this is the negative entropy, and this is a convex function. You can verify this. And another one, again, which is very popular in online learning is what is called the unnormalized negative entropy. Okay, so the unnormalized negative entropy is not restricted to beyond the simplex. You can have the entropy. You can extend the definition of the entropy to the entire non-negative orthant, and you can verify that this function is actually convex. So these are all some examples. This is sort of nice when you are getting into the field, you want to go back home and you want to review some of your lecture notes. This is a very nice set of exercises to do. Just prove Jensen's inequality, convince yourself that all these functions are convex. You know, they all satisfy the requirements of convexity. You know, and they're nice functions, they're well behaved and so on. And here is another one which uh, we will use again uh, in, the, in the second lecture is what is called the hinge laws. Okay, so here is a function. Again, you can verify that this function is piecewise linear. There's one piece and then another linear piece. And this function is also strong, is also convex. Okay? Clearly, this function is not strongly convex. Neither is it strictly convex, but it's convex nevertheless. And then there are a few others. Uh, I just got bored plotting the visualization, so I thought you could do some work. Uh, so you can, you can convince yourself 
either by doing plotting or if you're the analytic type, by actually working out the equations, that linear functions are, of course, always convex. The softmax function, this is a very, very important function okay, in machine learning, is convex. Um, and if you're curious to know why this is called the softmax function, come and talk to me in the break. I'll, I'll show you why this is a softmax function. Any kind of norm, for instance, the two norm, one norm, all these norms are convex okay, for, for appropriate values of p. OK. So intimately tied to the notion of convex functions is a notion which almost goes hand in glove, which is the notion of convex sets. Okay, so actually, in fact, if you look at uh, the, uh, you know, one of the most popular books on convex analysis, which is Rockefeller, Rockefeller doesn't start with convex functions. Right? The very first definitions in Rockefeller are all about convex sets. And then he defines convex functions as a consequence of the convex sets. Okay? Um, many a times I used to do that in my lectures, and then people would get all confused because they are all used to seeing the previous, like the definition of the convex function first. So I, I, I sort of switched to being the more conventional version. But actually, convex functions and convex sets are very, very intimately tied to each other. Okay, so let's see what what is the what is the tie in there. So if you if I give you a set, you can say that a set is convex if the following very simple property holds. If I take any two points inside the set, connect them up by a line, and that line entirely lies inside the set, then the set is convex. Okay? So this is again as opposed to a non-convex set where this property may not be satisfied. So here is a very simple example of a set which is not convex, right, a jelly bean shape set. And if I take a point here and a point here, it's clear that you see this part of the line segment doesn't lie inside the set. Okay? So again, another way to describe convex sets is to say they are sets which are nice and round in shape. Okay? So which means they extend nicely in all, all, there are no kinks or corners or there are no indentations inside the set. The set is nice and round. Actually, in some fields or areas, they're also called round sets for exactly this reason. And it turns out that there is, of course, a very close relationship between convex sets and convex functions. The relationship is as follows. So you all know that if I give you a function, if you just plot this function, this thick yellow, or this thick blue curve is called the graph of the function. right? So, oops. so you know that this is the graph of the function. And if you look at anything that lies above the graph of the function, right? so basically this shaded blue line going basically up to infinity. So if you look at anything that's above the graph of a function, that set is called the epigraph of the function. So in other words, you look at the function, anything that lies above. And if the epigraph of a convex of a function is convex, then the function is convex. Okay? This is again fairly straightforward to prove that if the epigraph, the, the, a function is convex if and only if its epigraph is convex. So it's a, it's a if and only if relationship. Okay? And in fact, this is the definition of convexity that Rockefeller uses. Okay? And then all the other things are proven as a consequence of that. On the other hand, there is also a, a relationship between convex sets and convex functions, which is very important, which is that if I give you a convex set and you write an indicator function for the set, but this is an indicator function which is written in a very non-intuitive way. So this is not what you would use as indicator functions, say, in measure theory, where you would have a 1 or a 0. Here, the indicator function of a set is it is 0 if the point belongs to the set and it is infinity otherwise. Okay? 
if you if you take such an indicator function then uh, sorry this is a typo that should be there. so the indicator function of a convex set is convex okay so there is a there is a clearly a very close connection between convex sets and convex functions actually this connection goes even further beyond and actually that's one of the main reasons why convexity is so important okay so now let me try to convince you why convexity is, is a really important concept so let's take our function. You can verify visually that it's a convex function. Okay. Now I'm going to do uh, do an operation on it, which is uh, which is to take this function and slice it. Okay. So for those of you who are meat eaters like Manfred, you will know this. This is like slicing your salami. <laughs> you slice this function. Okay. And you get these uh, sort of contours. Okay. And now let us look at the contours from the top. So you know, basically, it's just this the same thing, but I'm looking at it from the top. Okay. If I look at it from the top, notice something. What do you what do you see about all these slices? They are all really nice and round. In fact, they're all convex. Right? So you may say, oh well, you must be cheating. You just picked a function which looks like this, right? So let's take another function. So let's take the anomalous entropy, right? Do the same operation on it, slice it, and look at it from the top. What happens? Again, you see that the slices are convex. In fact, this is a general fact that if your function is convex, then these slices, these slices are called the level sets. So basically, they are all the set of all points for where the function lies below a certain value. Right? So they're called a level set. If a function is convex, then all its level sets are convex. Okay? Beautiful result. Beautiful result. Now, think about this. Is the converse true? If I give you a function, you slice it, you always find a convex set. Can you conclude that the function is convex? No. In general, it is not. So you can actually construct a counterexample. Anybody wants to venture into how? The upside down. The upside down. Yeah, but that's a yeah, that's a concave function. And then if you slice it. But actually, the level sets are not convex in that case. Because the upside down bowl, if you look at the level sets, the level sets have a hole in the center, and then they are the rest of the space. So that's not quite a counterexample yet. Yes. So if you take a function which looks like this, Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. If you take a function which looks like this, okay, clearly it is not convex. I can take any two points and you can see that it's not convex. But if I slice it at any point, I always get an interval. And an interval is a convex set. Right? So clearly the converse is not true. In fact, uh, this is this is again fascinating um, that you can you can show that these class of functions, where the level sets are always convex, are not too far away from being a convex function. In fact, they have a name which is called their quasi-convex. So these functions are set, the functions where all the level sets are convex for all uh, levels are called quasi-convex functions. Okay. They're not very far away from being a convex function, but they're not, they're not convex. Okay. Now, this intuition about level sets gives you a very, very deep insight about convex functions. Okay? Sort of a rather logical conclusion follows from this. Okay? The logical conclusion is that if I give you a function, you look at all its level sets. In particular, consider the level set 
of its minimum value. So suppose the function has some minimum value, take the minimum value and look at its level set. The level set of its minimum value will be a convex set. From this, what can you conclude? You can conclude that the set of all points on which a convex function attains its minimum is a convex set. Okay? So that's the very first conclusion and that's one of the reasons why convexity is so popular. In fact, you can say more, if your function is strictly convex, and this is again a very easy exercise, try this at home. If your function is strictly convex, then the point, the set of points where, it's, where it attains its minima is a single point. In other words, there is a unique global minimum associated with a strictly convex function. Right? This sort of already should get you all your tube lights at the back of your mind should be flashing, oh, this is the reason why convexity is so important. Right? If I give you a function which is strong, convex, so if you build a model, you come up with a function, so your objective function that you come up with when you build your model is a strictly convex function, it turns out that there is a unique global solution. In other words, there is a unique parameter which minimizes this function, or in other words, there's a unique solution to your problem. Okay? And that is exactly the reason why convexity is so important, why, why it is so much celebrated in machine learning. Yeah, uh, I'll take questions, start from here. Uh, you talked about this quasi-convex function. Are you going to talk about where do we use that? Where are they? <laughs> no, unfortunately not, no. We don't have, I mean, they, they, they are a completely, I mean, there is a whole fascinating field of optimizing quasi-convex functions, but we don't have time to. One very, one very uh, important application where they appear is um, in, uh, if you're doing vision and you want to do 3D reconstruction. So do you know these things called photosynth, for instance? So for, uh, you know, it's basically, you have different people taking pictures of the same monument, they all upload them on Flickr. Now you have 2D pictures of this object from very different angles by many different cameras, and you're trying to reconstruct this object. So let's say you, you, know, you go to the Purdue Bell Tower, right? I mean, lots of students take pictures of the Purdue Bell Tower starting you know, from different angles. Can you take all those pictures, merge them together into a 3D model to figure out how the 3D Bell Tower actually looks like? Mm, that's one of the places where quasi-convexity is used. Yeah, we talked about synchrostromic convex. Uh -huh. Uh, there is no equivalent definition for a s s sigma strongly convex set, not that I'm aware of, no. Other questions? Good. Okay. So now let's briefly talk about what sort of operations. So how can you, you know, one way to, to understand whether a function is convex is to uh, go and do this convexity, you know, the, the, the basic equation and check whether a function is actually satisfying those basic equations. Or you could say, well, this function has been composed by using many different convex functions and the composition that has been done preserves convexity. Right? So this is sort of one way in which you can figure out whether a function is convex or not. Okay, so let's see what are some operations which preserve convexity. If you talk of set operations, there are a few. I mean, this is only a small subset. Again, you know, if you want to really know the entire set of all possible operations that could potentially preserve convexity, you come to one of these convex analysis classes and you know, we revel in them for, for half the class. Okay? So, but here I'm just giving you a, a snapshot. So first of all, if you take an intersection of a, of a con set of convex sets, then it is convex. Okay? If you take an image of a convex set under a linear transformation. So if you take this set and you linearly transform it, then the resulting set is still convex. Okay? Again, the inverse image also of a, linear, of a convex set under a linear transformation is also convex. So in other words, anything linear that you do to a function more or less preserves convexity. Okay? If you, in, in terms of functions, if you take a function and you do a linear combination 
with non-negative weights. So in other words, you, you, know, you add some weight to the function and then you sum them up. Then that linear combination is always convex. Okay? And another one is if you have a set of functions which are convex and then you take a point-wise maximum of them, then that's convex. For instance, I just give you a simple example. If you have linear functions, so you just learned that linear functions are convex. Now I can compose linear functions by taking a max operation. Okay? And now I get this more complicated function. And this function is, of course, convex. Okay? If you take a function and you transform it in an affine fashion, so in other words, you, 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 oops, if you take uh, some matrix A, multiply the parameters, and then add some linear term to it, then this, if G is convex, then F of X is also convex. And uh, there's another one, which is if you project a function along a line, okay, you take any direction. So this is, a, this is a really nice geometric property. We will use it later in today's lectures. If I give you a function, and you slice it along any direction you want, Okay, so you, 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 you look along a direction. You'll get a one-dimensional function because you're, you're projecting the function along that direction. That projected function is always convex. So you look in any direction, so you, you sort of say, imagine yourself in n-dimensional space, you look in any direction, you project your function along that direction, you'll get a convex function. And of course, there are others, for instance, if you add a linear function to a convex function, it's always convex, okay? Things like that. Okay, so this is a quick example. Now let me talk about, so, so, so far, what have we done, right? So we said, oh, convexity is important, you know, I talked you up, I said, oh, you know, in machine learning, convexity was some sort of a revelation. Then I tried to convince you that Convex functions are important because they have this property that they are, they have a single unique global minimum, okay? But I haven't still told you anything about how are you going to identify that minimum? How do you know that you are at this optimum point, right? And that is of course very important. When you're trying to implement things, right? You could be searching all over the space but you need to know, you need to have a certificate of optimality, right? You need to say, oh, aha, I am at the optimum, right? So if somebody tells you, okay, you know, go off, here is a function, your advisor comes and tells you, here is a convex function, go off, find its minimum, right? So you do some, you know, crazy search in the space, you come back and you tell him, mm -mm -mm, I think this is the optimum, right? And he says, oh, prove it to me that this is the optimum. How do you prove it, right? So that's what we are going to talk about next, okay? Before we get into this, questions? We'll do that. So that's one of the one of the warm ups. Okay. Yeah. yeah, we will do that. Good question. Other questions? Good. Okay. So it turns out and, and again, this is something that I alluded to before too, that convexity is sort of this nice property. If a function satisfies very benign looking conditions, right? and more or less, they, they seem to be really benign looking conditions. If a function satisfies these benign looking conditions, you can make some very powerful, strong global statements about the function, okay? So what are the statements that you can make? The first statement you can make is that if you take a fu convex function, okay, you, you know this, uh, so let's take, let, let's, let's concentrate on that red point, okay? And more or less most of you have done this at some point in your life uh, when you went to high school, you know, you wanted to draw tangents to curves, right? So, you know, you drew curves and then you took a ruler and you drew a tangent to the curve, right? Uh, what you were doing at that time really was, I mean, uh, at that time you say, oh, I'm drawing a tangent to a curve. When you get into university, you become more sophisticated and you say, oh, I'm taking the first order Taylor expansion of the function around the point, right? It's just, you learn more jargon. But basically what the jargon means is that if you take the first order Taylor expansion 
of the function around that point, right? So this is the first order Taylor expansion of that function around that point. This is a universal lower bound to the function. Anywhere you go, this line will never intersect this blue line except at that point. Okay? Uh, so this is sort of the whole function lies above this hyperplane. Okay? This is a global statement. Remember, I mean, this is a statement which says nowhere is this hyperplane going to be, you know, is this function going to cross this hyperplane? Nowhere. Comes from sort of very local properties that you talked about for a convex function. You just said, oh, you know, if I take two points, the value of the function actually lies below these two points everywhere, then you can make such global properties, such global claims. And this is sort of remarkable, and you'll see how this simple fact can actually be used. So we will talk about this in the third lecture, as to how this simple fact can be exploited to actually derive or devise optimizers for convex functions. Okay, so that, we'll wait for that for the third lecture. But let's go on and uh, do some other sort of fun things with this observation. The fact that the function lies above the hyperplane at all points of time allows you to derive what, is, what looks like a distance measure. Right? So what, let me make this a bit more clearer. Suppose if you have this function, you know this location, okay? And here is another location. So there are two, two locations, x, x and x prime, okay? And you want to sort of say, as given by the function, what is the distance between x and x prime? Sort of think of it, that's the right way to think about it is that as given by the function, how far away are x and x prime? You can do, you can answer this question in the following way. You can say, okay, I take a, 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 a first order Taylor expansion around x prime, okay? Evaluate that first order Taylor expansion at x. Okay, so I get this, this blue point. I have the true value of the function at x. Because I know that the first order Taylor expansion is always a lower bound to the function, I know that f of x is always going to be larger than this guy. Okay? So I take the difference so between f of x and this first order Taylor expansion. That difference is called the Bregman divergence. Okay? The Bregman divergence has again many beautiful properties, um, some of which Manfred will talk about, including the fact that it is convex in its first argument and so on and so forth. But here I just want to show you again, this is just to give you a flavor for two very popular Bregman divergences that people use in machine learning. Okay? The first divergence that more or less most of you use but maybe not even realize that it's a Bregman divergence is, is that you have a, if you take your function to be one half norm square, then it turns out, you can verify this, that the Bregman divergence given by the function is nothing but the Euclidean distance square. Okay, so if you have been using Euclidean distance to measure distance between points, without realizing it, you have actually been using a Bregman divergence. Okay? Yeah, simple question. Can you just explain the angle bracket? Oh, so, yeah, sorry. Yeah, it's, I use this all the time and it's, yeah, I forget to. So this is just a dot product. So an angle, angle bracket simply means x minus x prime transpose the gradient of f at x prime. Okay, so that's, uh, yeah, this is, I use this all the time in my lectures. Um, it's just because what we are talking about is not just restricted to Euclidean spaces. So actually, more or less everything that I'm talking about can be extended to, to a reproducing kernel Hilbert space and uh, with some technicalities to a, to a Banach space. Okay, so that's why I always use this notation to sort of remind myself that this is happening at the background. Okay? And deliberately not use the, either the dot or the transpose notation. But I think Manfred consistently uses the Euclidean notation because he hates Hilbert spaces. <laughs> <laughs> because he thinks they're too complex. <laughs> well, they don't tell me anything new. <laughs> <laughs> it's just Hilbert Hilbert. That's 
and uh, this is another one again uh, this is uh, this is an uh, this is a Bregman divergence that is uh, that is very well used in in machine learning is uh, the the uh, unnormalized relative entropy okay and sort of uh, one word uh, of insight or caution or whatever you want to call it if intuitively you are always working on rn like the entire space okay then this distance measure more or less is the right thing to use. But if somehow, because of your modeling assumptions or because of the way you have set up the problem or after you have jumped through some of the duality gymnastics, your problem ends up being on a simplex, then something like this is sort of the right measure to use. So on a simplex, the right notion of distance somehow seems to be the Bregman. I mean, this is a very loose statement. This is just sort of an insight. But if you're working on the simplex, this is, seems to be more or less the right divergence to use. If you're working in Rn, then that seems to be the right divergence to use. Okay? And this is just an a, a insight. Okay, so now let's get to this question of, okay, how are you going to identify the minimum? So since you know this first order property, there is a, there's a very simple way to, to at least do one part. So to show the forward implication, the reverse implication takes a bit more time. But again, it's doable, which is that if I give you a function, okay, this is differentiable and convex. Okay, so it's very important that it's differentiable and convex. Then you can say that a point is a minimizer if it satisfies this condition. Okay. Well, this condition looks ugly. A very easy way to ensure that this condition is satisfied is to simply set the gradient to zero. Okay. Again, this provides you a very deep insight. Very um, important revelation, which is that if I want to find the minimum of a, of a convex function, all I really need to do is take its gradient and set it to zero. And I'm done. Nothing more to do. Right? This is not true if you have a non-convex function. A non-convex function may have a gradient of zero, but that may not even be a minimum point. Right? It could be a maxima. Right? Or it could not be a global minima. It could just be a local minima. But here, you are assured that if you can somehow set the gradient to zero, you are done. Okay? So if your, if your advisor tells you, okay, here is a convex function, off you go and find its minima, okay? You can find a point, and not only can you find a point, you can go back to him and say, look, this is the minimum and I can prove it. And here is the certificate for it, okay? Just compute the, the gradient, set it to zero. Okay? So this is the advantage. So before we go on, questions? Comments? So let's do subgradients and then we'll take a short break and we'll come back to do other things. Okay. So so far, if you have been paying attention and not quite sleeping, you'd realize that more or less all the functions that I showed you were all nice and differentiable. I mean they were all nice, smooth, you could take gradient except one or two instances when I flashed some non-differentiable functions to you. So you sort of sort of start wondering. What is the, what, what, what's the deal here? What is the relationship between differentiability and convexity? Is there any connection? You know, you sort of seem to keep on implying that convex functions are nice, but are they so nice that they are always differentiable? Of course, convex functions need not always be differentiable. Right? So, you know, here is an example of a function. This is piecewise linear. And like we knew from our, from our discussion about compositions of uh, convexity preserving operations, we know that this function is convex. Clearly, the function is not differentiable at these kink points. Okay? So what do we do? Is everything lost? Apparently not. Right? So again, we go back to our high school intuition. Ask, okay, can I draw a tangent to this function, right? So at this point that you talk about, which is non-differentiable, can I draw a tangent line? Okay, so you take your ruler, you go off, off you draw a tangent. And clearly you can verify that this is a tangent line, okay? And 
more importantly, you can also verify that this tangent line still satisfies that property that I talked about, which is that this tangent line lies below this function. Okay. So it seems to be that if you could almost conclude that oh, every convex function is differentiable in some sense, right? But apparently not. So the function is not quite differentiable because of the following problem. Okay, so you drew this line, you show it to your friend, and your friend draws that line. Right? Of course, that is also a valid tangent line, right? And you have this big argument about who's right and wrong. And then your third friend comes along and draws a third line. Okay? And so on and so forth. So what happens is that if a function is convex, then a very deep um, conclusion that you can draw is that at every point where the function is defined, you can draw a tangent line, at least a tangent line. Okay? In other words, the function may not be what is called differentiable everywhere, but it is what is called sub-differentiable everywhere. Right? So there is always a notion of a tangent. Okay, and how do you define the tangent? By saying that you say that S, a vector S is a subgradient if it satisfies this first order property that we had. The only sort of fly in the ointment is that there are some places for a convex function where it could happen that there are more than one S. Right? There could be more than one vectors which satisfy this condition. But if the function is differentiable, again you can verify that there will be exactly one, fun one vector, which is the gradient, that satisfies this equation. Okay? So this is sort of a strict no generalization of the notion of gradients. And this is remarkable again that a convex function will always be sub-differentiable everywhere. So a sub-gradient will always exist for a convex function. And whenever, you, whenever I talk about subgradients, I, I, I write the set of subgradients as partial of f of w. So, the, so whenever you see this partial of f of w, at the back of your mind, you should be thinking a set. Okay? If it is differentiable, then this set just has a single term. If it is not differentiable, then the set contains more than one point. Okay? So here is an example, a classic example of a function, which is convex, but not differentiable. Okay, so the, this, this is just a V-shaped function. It's clearly not differentiable at 0. Okay? But you can show, or you can, I mean, this is again something you can do easily. Any line with a slope which lies between minus 1 to plus 1 is tangential to this function, which means that at 0, the set of subgradients of this function is this interval minus 1 to 1. So this is kind of nice because it, you know, it's saying that the function is differentiable everywhere. In some sense, there's a notion of, there, there is some notion of, of gradient that exists everywhere. And it is also nice in the sense that you can extend the previous result that I talked about. So you remember I talked about if, if it is a differentiable convex function, then there was a property that you needed to satisfy. Now, there is a slightly different property that needs to satisfy for, uh, for the point to be an optimum, and this can be satisfied by ensuring that zero belongs to the subgradient set. But this is sort of, again, keep this in mind. We will come back to this point in greater detail. This, this benign looking condition causes you enormous headaches. When you are dealing with non-differentiable functions, this benign looking condition will come back to bite you very badly. Okay, so I'm just, this is just a preview. We will talk a lot more about it as we go along. So I think this is a this is a good time for some questions and a break. Questions first? Yep. So if zero is a subgradient, then we have that x is a minimizer, so of course it's going to be over a square. Yes. So this is an if and only if condition, right? So it says that this if this condition is satisfied, then x is a minimizer, and if x is a minimizer, then this condition is satisfied. 
so zero always so so this is the this condition needs to be satisfied and one way of satisfying this condition is to ensure that zero belongs to the subgradient set so if zero belongs to the subgradient set you are assured that you are at the optimum and the other way around if you are at the optimum there will always be a zero okay. other questions okay so let's take a 5 minute break and we'll come back Just not sure the max over i of x u and x i. What exactly? Uh, so I, I might just be missing. So some time. so this is just I'm just assuming that these these linear functions are defined by a vector. So I, you know like a like a plane can be given by its normal, right? So this is just the normal to the plane. I'm given a bunch of planes. So each plane defines one of these lines. And then I'm taking a max over there. Oh, and you just have a lot of planes at any. Yeah, point exactly, there. exactly. So, like, you know, what I have is something like this. I have a bunch of planes. <laughs> 